nothing chilling at the Holiday Inn. Hey, that's <laughs> what I'm going to do sing. That's what I'm going to do. I'll just sing some Snoop Dogg lyrics. All right. Well, it looks like we are live now. Um, uh, so uh, Kanye, I'm on. <laughs> That's who you voted for. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to our evening here with George Singleton and Ron Rash. Um, they'll be reading um, from and discussing their uh, new collections, George Singleton's um, You Want More and Ron Rash is in the Valley. Um, we are uh, in partnership with uh, Nevermore Books in Beaufort and Lori Anderson is here with us. You can get signed copies, uh, both of these uh, from Nevermore Books. And now I'd like to introduce uh, our writers. Ron Rash is the author of the Penn Faulkner finalist and New York Times bestselling novel, Serena. In addition to the critically acclaimed novels, the Risen, Above the Waterfall, The Cove, One Fit in Eden, Saints at the River, and The World Made Straight. Four collections of poems and six collections of stories, among, the, among them Burning Bright, which won the 2010 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. Nothing Gold Can Stay, a New York Times bestseller, and Chemistry and Other Stories, which was a finalist for the 2007 Penn Faulkner Award. Also twice the recipient of the O. Henry Prize and winner of the 2019 Sidney Lanier Prize for Southern Literature. He is the Paris Distinguished Professor in Appalachian Cultural Studies at Western Carolina University and lives in Clemson, South Carolina. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. And now George Singleton has published eight collections of stories, two novels, and a book of writing advice. Over 200 of his stories have appeared in magazines such as The Atlantic Monthly, Harper's, Playboy, The Georgia Review, The Southern Review, The Cincinnati Review, and elsewhere. He is the recipient of a Pushcart Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Hillsdale Award for the Fellowship of Southern Writers, and the Corrington Award for Literary Excellence. He now lives in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Thank you, George. Thank you both for being here. Um, I will turn it over to you now. Um, I will let our audience know that throughout you can post your questions in the chat feature. Um, and George and Ron will both be taking questions um, when we near the end of our, our session. So I'll uh, turn it over to you and let you take it from here. All right, we're going to read first. <clears throat> and I am going to read from a story that came out about a uh, I don't know, within the last year in a magazine, because to be quite honest, I'm a little bit tired of reading my own crap in that book, You Want More, because it's been getting old, reading the same thing over and over. Ron and I have done a few of these things in Nashville, here in Buford, in Atlanta, I think, maybe Atlanta twice, I don't know. But I'm tired of boring my buddy Ron. I'm gonna read a couple pages uh, from a story called What a Dime Costs. Y'all okay? I don't know, because I can't see you. One afternoon when I might have been 13 years old, my father came home in his paint splattered truck more than intent. He limp stomped inside the house. This was summer, and I sat at the kitchen table drinking Kool-Aid sloppily so as to dye my upper lip red. He jerked his thumb toward the door. I looked up scared as I did at least once a day. Did I forget to cut the grass, clean the gutters, wash yesterday's brushes, or let my mother pass out in the lounge chair she set up in the backyard on the edge of where she believed we needed a swimming pool? I should mention that my father was a house painter, and if he'd have lived in a time where every child got free psychological tests, he would have certainly been diagnosed, diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, all those others. I doubt another house painter in the South had placed so many of his half-filled gallons of Sher Sherwin-Williams in the back of his truck, forgotten to tamp down the lids, then driven fast toward home as many times as my father. You could drive all over Draytown and see where my father had been 
from the streaks of latex that toppled over in the bed of his truck, then drained out the bottom of his tailgate like so much bulldog flu slobber. Draytown homeowners had a thing for light blue and yellow back then. I wasn't much of a sports fan, but I would bet that anyone following a college team with such colors would have felt welcomed in the town of my upbringing. That's right, Draytown. A dray is an old fashioned word for a squirrel's nest. According to legend, and it's now on Wikipedia because I put it there, some Scottish Irish settlers came through the area hungry, looked up, got out their muskets or long rifles or slingshots, killed a couple score of fox and gray squirrels, celebrated with a good stew, then settled. My father kept his thumb pointed toward the carport. I said, what, what did I do? I didn't do anything. You gotta come look at this, my father said. I need to teach you a lesson. I licked my upper lip over and over. A previous lesson involved how no one ever trusted a red mustache man or woman. That lecture turned into something about Eric the Red. I'm not sure how he knew about a Viking. And then a guy named Boyd Lott, my mom dated in high school, who had red hair and ended up being a funeral director. I got up out of the gold paisley vinyl back kitchen chair and hopped the one step down into the carport. Did I leave the mailbox door open, forget to pick up the paper that morning, or leave the hose running when I was supposed to spray my mom hourly in her lounge chair so she could feel as if she stood near a waterfall? My father's pickup didn't drip paint on the cement driveway, which would make my mother happy enough. If I'd have been a skateboarder back then, I could have practiced on the short vert wall of dried paint like a rubbery multicolored stalagmite that grew on the cement. He said, look in the back what I got today. I peered over the truck bed's rim and saw 30 box turtles in various realms of distress. Some of them had turned over and wiggled their legs in that internationally understood fauna language of turn me over. Others remain anchored. All of them own slight blue or yellow paint on their shells. It took some years for me to understand that my father hadn't worked a lick that day, that he'd plain driven the countryside on the lookout for tortoises wishing to cross a two lane. I said, where'd you get all these? My father smiled finally. He nodded his head up and down about 10 seconds too long. He said, let me tell you something, cock. I need to teach you something about amphibians on the move. I did not say they're reptiles. A wooden paint stirrer hurts more than a belt or a switch. I read something the other day, he said. I don't know how the human mind works, but looking back all these years, I truly believe that, he, that if he had never read this particular article, which ended up being printed in the Draytown Herald's Friday edition that always featured fun facts to know and tell on the opposite side of Beetle Bailey, Charlie Brown, The Born Loser, Ziggy, that one about a guy named Leroy, all comics that featured men who'd never amount to anything. I would not have spent five years in a single parent household. My father said, I read about how you should never pick up a turtle and take it away from where it's going. Turtle like this, it roams around like a square mile all of its life. If you take it out of its habitat, it'll get confused and quit eating and it'll die. He spent about a half minute saying the word habitat, stressing every syllable equally. My father called me cock. My real name is Julian. We are walkers. My mother wanted to name me after her favorite uncle, Uncle Julian. My father thought it sounded like a girl's name. I don't know what made him relent, but he always called me cock. Cock walker, cock of the walkers. I said, are you going to take these things back to where you got them? How could he remember wh which were which and where he picked them up, I thought even then. My father shook his head. That's my lesson, cock. Life is not fair. I looked at the tortoises. I wasn't tall enough to reach over and down in order to flip the upside down ones. I said, you need to take them back. My mother came out wherever she'd been hiding. She yelled out, 
We're out of Dr. Pepper, God damn it, talking to my father. She yelled out, did you remember to stop by the store? She said, you don't like the way I spend my days? I need some Dr. Pepper. My father didn't look her way. I did. She'd spread some kind of avocado spread on her face and wore thin cucumber slices plugged into her eye sockets. My father said to me, you either realize that you need to stay in the place where you were born or you take the chance of dying out there elsewhere. He said, yep, yep, yep. I said, tonight's Hungarian goulash night because that's how we lived. That's the beginning of that story. All right. Well, I'm going to read uh, just a, the opening uh, to the novella In the Valley. And this is uh, where Serena Pemberton returns to North Carolina. When Serena Pemberton stepped out of the Commodore seaplane in July of 1931, a small but fervent contingent of reporters and photographers awaited her. Except for the pilot, she was alone. Those who would accompany her to the logging camp, both beast and human, had arrived by ship the night before. They were already on the train that would take them from Miami to North Carolina. All except for her minion Galloway, who procured an automobile to drive Serena to the station. As the metal ramp was readied, Galloway positioned himself beside the bottom step. He was short and wiry, shabbily dressed, a purple stump protruding from one sleeve. His cameras flashed mere inches from his face. He did not blink. As Serena descended, the first question shouted at her addressed the rumors surrounding her husband's death. For a moment, it didn't appear she would answer. But when her booted feet settled securely on the ground, the question was asked again, but with a caveat that she loved her husband. I love my husband, but one always learns from disappointments. But what of his death, Mrs. Pemberton, and what of so many others of your acquaintance, the reporter asked. Logging is a dangerous business, she answered. Galloway was in front of her now, but Serena, almost a head taller, was clearly visible. He cleared a path as more questions came. Would she continue to fight against the National Park? And would she address the rumor that she was connected to the recent demise of Horace Kephart, the park's chief advocate? Did she oppose the Davis-Bacon Act? Why risk a transatlantic enterprise when she and her late husband had achieved so much in the States? Galloway opened the DeSoto's passenger door. Serena was about to get in when the sole woman in the group a reporter for the New Republic, stepped close. She was very young, but like Serena, tall and blonde. When will you have achieved all your ambitions, Mrs. Pemberton? She asked as others jostled around them. When the world and my will are one, Serena answered. And the woman, the young woman is uh, Martha Gellhorn, who was a really great World War II correspondent uh, and, uh, and also a uh, fiction writer, uh, mar once married to, to Hemingway, but she was a pretty strong personality in her own right. How'd you come across that some years? Did you know, did you know that when you wrote Serena the novel? Uh, I'd, I'd read about Gail Horn and read something a little bit, you know, not a lot, but wrote some of her essays or, you know, stories that she posted during World War II. Uh, but, uh, you know, it just kind of, I, I thought it'd be interesting to have, I wanted somebody in that opening scene to uh, ask a question, and it just kind of came to me. I thought it'd be kind of fun. I, I think, think it's a lot of fun, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's one thing that you and I both know is that it's, it's a lot of fun sometimes just to, uh, I mean, you have to do something fun when you're writing as much as we've done over the decades that you just have to entertain yourself or little end jokes and uh, which uh, we've tended to do, uh, you know, uh, as I've said before, you've got the advantage with my last name being Rash, that doesn't seem fair. But uh, yeah, just I make fun of Singleton, he makes fun of Rash and uh, yeah, just those little things that kind of 
you know, whether the reader catches them or not always, that's, it's, it's just, it's fun, yeah. Listen, uh, this guy named Cock Walker, for a while I was gonna have his last name be Rash, but then I went, nah, I better not do that. <laughs> It'd be too weird. <laughs> well, yeah. I, you, you've done enough damage to- <laughs> I think, yeah, we need to quit. We said yeah. that before though, but yeah. we need to quit. All right. Uh, they taught. <laughs> yeah, detente, which is such a popular word uh, in 2020. Yeah. <laughs> um, by the way, I'm so sorry that your man uh, lost the election for president. Um, so um, <laughs> that's fun to tell people in a crowded. Oh place. yeah, that, yeah, that's nice, George. <laughs> Actually, I I had a bumper sticker on the back of my car, Ralph Stanley for president. But I, I don't, you know, the bluegrass musician. Ralph Stanley, yeah. I still think he might have been a better choice than we, you know. <laughs> what we've had recently. So. I do too. Hey, uh, uh, talk about, uh, I guess I'm asking you questions. What the hell? Um, you know, short stories, God damn, how come no one's, by, we should ask Brooke this, Brooke, Brooke McKinney. They're not selling in America. What's the story? Come on, America. You know, I understand poetry not selling, kind of. But gee whiz, you know, come on. You'd, love, you'd rather you'd rather write short stories, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think you would too. Uh, yeah. And you would think with the way life is now, it's tends to be fragmented. I think attention spans are suffering some from technology. I I mean, I sense that even in myself. Yeah, Me short stories would be perfect. Uh and I, I don't know, you know, you, you, you publish more than I do. And I mean, are you getting a sense so that the journals, that people are reading them there and that they, they don't want to buy a book necessarily that they, because they. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. You know, since this pandemic I've written, I've actually written a lot and I've sent it out and I've heard from no one. I don't know if the magazines are kind of shut down. I assume they are, you know, yeah. or I, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, and I would think, you know, one thing that you do interesting in that excerpt you just did, I mean, you, you're, you're funny, but there's always that deeper undercurrent, you know, uh, which I thought we saw with the father. But um, you would think now that writers who use humor would be so welcome. I mean, yeah. I, know I am. I mean, I, I find myself, uh, you know, turning, uh, listening to comedians on podcast, you know, I listened to one Dave Chappelle recently, Bill Burr, and uh, you know, I think we need that kind of relief. So you would think that, particularly with uh, stories that can do that, would be good. Yeah, yeah, I don't get it, uh, but you know, so be it. Uh, I ain't got nothing else. What else? What else? What? Else, what you want to talk about? Want to talk about trash? Well, uh, yeah, we can talk about track and field and how we met. That was all. That's always a good story. You tell that one very well. And uh, you know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me tell this story. Back in 1974, maybe 73, 73 or 74. Um, I had this buddy. Well, before that, I had this buddy named Philip Snotty. Unfortunate last name. He was a great runner. He ran two miles in high school in like nine minutes and 40 seconds. He probably ran the mile in about four, less than 430, 420 maybe. Yeah. I don't know. And he went to Gardner-Webb University. And so he went up there to run because they had this great track coach named Bill Freeman. And Bill Freeman had been a coach at University of Oregon. And anybody here listening knows that University of Oregon was the greatest track program in America. They had Steve Prefontaine. They were great. So Freeman, from what I understand, look at me, you know, from what I've heard later, he, his, he had a wife from North Carolina, I think, and, and she said, I really want to go back home. So he came back and he started to, to be a coach at, at um, Gardner Webb. So my buddy, Philip Snotty, again, kind of an unfortunate last name, said to Bill Freeman, I got this little buddy, he's a few years younger than I am, but he's doing okay. Maybe you'd like to see him. Bill Freeman said, bring him on up. 
So I couldn't even drive back then. My parents, this is a different time, drove me up to Boylan Springs, North Carolina, dropped me off on a Friday afternoon, said, see you Sunday, and left. So there I am, you know, to go running with my buddy, Phil Snotty, and learn some, a lot of stuff, because I didn't have the best high school track coach, from this guy, Bill Freeman. And who should be there but, but Ron Rash, also running track, also flying, like a 152, something like that, half mile. Not 800 meters, half mile. Tell me the exact time. Oh, uh, 153, yeah. <laughs> you, you get yeah. So, okay, never mind. I didn't know that you were like dragging a leg. Okay, 153 half mile. So, uh, you know, then my parents brought me up there two or three times. And, and we would go and run these crazy runs on um, fire, fire roads and go down to this place called the French, what's it, not the French Broad River. What's it called? Yeah, the French Broad. French Broad. And this guy, this coach, I was like 14, 15 years old. And he was saying, tell, told my buddy Philip, when that Singleton kid shows up, tell him to bring some fireworks up from South Carolina because you couldn't get them in North Carolina. So I bring them, these bottle rockets, and it ends up Ron and Philip and I and Coach Freeman were shooting these bottle rockets, this is environmentally correct in the early 70s, into the river and watching them kind of flash, you know. That was a lot of fun until the cop showed up. <laughs> All ran into some briar patch and fell over a 55-gallon drum, whatever. A hundred years went by, a hundred years. I quit running, I got kind of hurt. I really hurt my, um, I forget what that thing is. It goes across here. Um, I always forget that word, oblique. I really ruined an oblique. And I went to Furman, thus the FU, uh, to run track. But then my senior year, I just really petered out, but I still went to Furman, um, no matter what. A hundred years after that, I was teaching at this place called Francis Marion. And here comes this guy named Ron Rash to see, I believe, his brother Tom Rash give a paper for some Christianity and literature conference. And because of Christianity and literature, of course, I was at the forefront of this obligation. So I go and I meet, see somebody introduced me to Ron Rash. I said, Ron Rash, that sounds familiar, familiar, familiar. And he said, George Singleton, that sounds familiar too. Hey, are you Philip Snotty's little buddy? Because I was like five foot two and a hundred pounds back then. And then maybe two years later, I moved up to Dacusville. Ron lived in uh, P Pendleton, excuse me. And, and boy, I mean, who would think that we would both be writers, both be trying to write, especially back then in 1992, both of us just kind of struggling. Oh, I sent off something. Uh, oh, I got a nice rejection. I mean, it's just a weird, it's a weird, small world, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was amazing. And uh, then George became part of my family with my children. And, you know, he was always the, 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 the sketchy uncle that they loved being. <laughs> you know, I'd be, he'd be trying to sneak them a cigarette, you know, when they're eight years old and uh, uh, teaching them new, <laughs> teaching them new words. <laughs> I would teach him new words and maybe it was a beer. I don't think I would uh, offer him a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> but I know they yeah. stick to me a bunch. Yeah. George, do you smoke? Uh, do you, Brooke? <laughs> I do have some questions for you. No, <laughs> say, say you don't smoke so I can say good, more for me. <laughs> I don't. Good, more for me. <laughs> uh, uh, that was a great story. Um, I was going to ask, we've got a few questions posted in our uh, chat here, if y'all want to yeah. see. Um, let's see. Oh, so Heather asked, if writing historical fiction, how much worry do you put into getting it right? Or how much do you let the task of research disrupt slash enhance your story? That's Ron. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you want to get it as as right as you can. I, I think that 
you have the reader has to believe the little things first, to, you know, to believe the big lie that's a novel. Um, and the other thing I found that's interesting is that readers kind of like to learn, you know, history, true things through fiction. Um, Hillary Mantel's Wolf Hall, you know, is a great example of this. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I do my very best to to get it all right. I do as much research, but uh, inevitably I get something wrong and there's always somebody who's going to uh, let me know about that. Uh, you know, sending me a letter or an email and uh, that's okay. But um, uh, I did have a situation a few years ago, I think George knows this story, but um, I got a, a phone call from this guy uh, because I'd written a, in the world made straight I had a Civil War massacre scene where Union sympathizers in Western North Carolina were killed, 13 of them, including a 12 year old boy. And uh, so I, I'd read a whole book about that massacre. I'd gone back and actually found an 1863 article about it uh, in the New York Times about the massacre. And so I, I and in all those accounts, the 12 year old boy had been the last one to die. And so anyway, this guy said, well, you got that wrong. Guy over the phone, you know, he wasn't the last one to die. And so I said, well, you know, all my sources said that. I, mean, I didn't get defensive. I just said, well, what are your sources? And he said, well, uh, I, you know, I and my team of paranormal investigators went <laughs> to the grave site and, 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 you know, the ghost told us that, you know, that, Ron Rash got this wrong on page 248. So uh, yeah, th 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 those things will bring out the crazy sometimes. Uh, and, and that's kind of strange, the kind of responses you sometimes get. I'm sure you've got stories about that too, George. Uh, email never, 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 never. You also had a story about, a, didn't you, I don't know if we, I hope she's not. Didn't you have a story about some a woman named Serena who contacted you? Is yeah, it, you ruined yeah. her life, or yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, I, that was. I don't know. I'm a freak magnet. I mean, they come my way. I had a story one time. I think it's in the it's in this book about a and a it, the, there was one sentence that said she was beautiful, but she was crazy, and this woman showed up out of nowhere. Glenda and I were just standing there. We were, we were working on a house. We were building this cabin. You've been there. We've been fishing there. Yeah. Camp Skyuka. I had a hammer in my hand and this woman showed up and she said, you have written about me and it has upset me and my husband. And she went on and on and I had this framing hammer in my hand. I went, get off my property. Like that. She took off running. But golly, I mean, you can't win. Yeah. All right, next question, Brooke. All right, let's see. Um, can either one of you talk about character development? Uh, do Go you, ahead. Do you Go ahead, George. Keep asking that question, Brooke. So <laughs> <I can laughs> uh, do you live with the characters uh, you create either vicariously or as the work progresses? That's a good question. Uh, Boy, you know, um, Ron and I have talked about this a little bit, like uh, um, he kind of sees an image and starts from that, and I kind of hear a voice and start from that. Uh, you know, I'll hear, I'll just, a line will hit my head, and and I'll go from there, and, and then it just progresses. I don't know. Um, normally, I kind of write from a, um, I mean, I've, lately especially, I've tried to write about more, um, female main characters but but i'm almost scared to do that because i'm scared i'm gonna just do it wrong i don't want to let female i don't want to let women down you know golly i wouldn't i would never think of that whatever a man you can write you know from a male point of view you can just write get as long as the guy's just kind of a jerk you got it right so um just kind of let it go and see where see where it, you know See where the see where that path goes. You never know. For me, for me, yeah. For me, it's just. Uh, I mean, it's it's almost you're 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 essentially living with these characters. So it's like living with real people. You, they start to reveal more about themselves. I find, and uh, it's very often it's when I lock into a voice 
that I feel like I've really got the character down. Uh, but it is a, uh, it's, it's, I think it's a lot like method acting. You just, in a sense, try to uh, enter that sensibility uh, and, uh, and, and, and actually Denzel Washington once said, somebody asked him about what's the key to, to being really successful at, at acting. And he says, you don't get in the way of the character. And I think uh, what I want to do, and I think, you know, we, what we all both want to do is uh, be as true to that character as we can. So we kind of, I actually, I, I would argue that even if you don't believe about free will for humans, you should believe it for your characters. You know, wow, that's nice. You yeah. into that direction. Yeah, that's, and you know, that's, golly, that's a great, great line. Yeah, we may not have, we as humans may not believe in free will, but by golly, those characters are going to do what they want to do, whether you like, whether you as a writer like it or not, you know, and see where that happens. That's good answers. Um, okay, let's see. Um, um, this is for both George and Ron. Which story was the most fun to write? Uh, you know, for me, I wrote a story called Show and Tell in about 1999, and it was a different kind of story. For me, it was a first-person retrospective. It was about a guy, kind of like that story that I read tonight. It was about a guy looking back at his life when he kind of had a questionable, unpredictable, unreliable father, and the the narrator, although an adult, goes, oh, you know, here's, here's what might be wrong with me now, or now this makes some sense. I, Ryan and I had a buddy named Dale Ray Phillips, wrote a book called My People's Waltz, which a bunch of them are stories of first person retrospective looking back. And I'm a slow learner, so I didn't write one of those up until this point when I was a, write, when I was a writer today, I would even say writer. Um, back th before then, I would go, okay, I'm 32 years old. I'm going to write a story about a 32-year-old guy. I'm 34 years old, 34-year-old main character. But when I learned from, from that, and also from reading a guy named Louis Norton, who wrote Music of the Swamp and Wolf Whistle, um, I went, God, that's kind of fun, to because you get to use your adult language in telling the story, and then, you know, the, um, the, the dialogue might have to be more like a 12 year old talking, but you know, so when I first learned that and started doing okay with those kinds of stories, that, that was my first time of really kind of having fun. And since then I've written a bunch of those kinds of stories. Well, I think the fun part is when, when you suddenly realize what, you know, uh, you, you know you've got it. It just kind of locks in. Uh, probably the story I, I feel like maybe is one I'm proudest of is called The Ascent. It's a story about a 12-year-old uh, boy, or not even 12, I think he's eight, who uh, comes across a uh, plane crash, a small plane crash in the uh, Smoky Mountains. And uh, I i have been trying to write that story probably for about four or five years because I'd actually read where uh, a bear hunter had found a plane like that that had been lost for several years. And uh, I knew there was a story there, but then just one morning I had an image of a uh, uh, child's footprints and, and a sense of the child coming up to that plane. And the moment I knew, I, I really felt like the story kind of locked in was when he looked into the plane and he wasn't frightened by what he saw. And then, you know, I really started to realize why he wasn't frightened and all of it came. But um, a story I just had maybe just pure fun, just writing start to finish was one called Waiting for the End of the World, where a guy has to play a free bird every hour at a bar. And that was, that was one of those kind of just voice driven stories. And uh, that was kind of fun. You know, um... I'm going to interrupt a little bit. Today, Linda and I were driving to the bank and to the post office because we don't get out of the car, don't leave that often. 
I don't know what brought it up, but I started, I said to her, Ron Rash and I both probably, I assume you, my parents were not, were like lower middle class, but my father thought it necessary to have this big old Cadillac. Mm -hmm. I mean, like a, like at a funeral Cadillac. And when I took my, um, Glenn and I were talking about driver's test. I guess we drove by the DMV. And I said, when I took the DMV test, oh no, we were driving past a student driver thing. So when I took that thing, I was going real slow because that Cadillac was about 40 feet long. And the idiot test guy, the instructor said, why are you going so slowly? And I went, because it's a big car, it'll barely fit. And you had that story early, early on about driving in, about a character driving in a Cadillac with the lights on because it's raining and people pulling over the side of the road because they thought it was a funeral. You know, yeah. you and I both have that kind of same bizarre. There's this thing we I was talking about earlier about um, first person retrospective. I think Ron and I both, and a lot of people have had some odd things happen in childhood that maybe we didn't realize later on would be the deepest well in the world to dip a bucket into to write about. I mean, you know, I growing up, you just think, oh, this is growing up. But looking back on it, you go, man, my dad punched a guy and broke his jaw and I came home and my mother was crying. And, and I said, what happened? She said, your father's going to prison, which didn't happen, but she thought that was gonna happen and you, you know, you got the grandfather who can't read, but pretends like he can. I mean, we got these kind of weird, yeah. weird, weird stories that I forget what the question was, but, but I went off on it. Well, I, I, yeah, my father has a story. I've never, I've, I've never been able to get it into something. I need to write a story about it. But he, when he was 16, he, he dropped out of high school. He later became a teacher, as you know. Yeah. Uh, but um, he, uh, grew up in Mill Village, but he was in, he went to, he decided to go to Portland because they were hiring and they, a couple of our cousins up in North Carolina, they all went together, three of them. And, and what they did, they put them in a box car with about 10 other men. And they were, they were on the tracks, you know, this train going, I don't know, 40, 50 miles an hour. And two men got into a knife fight inside that box car, <laughs> closed. And these guys were slashing away. These men were just running. And I, you know, I've never found that I'll, I'll use that eventually. Yeah. You know, my father, my father dropped out of high school in 10th grade also, or, you know, 16, 17, and went to the, he's, you know, from Dallas, Texas, and went to the West Coast and joined the Merchant Marines. You know, same, I didn't know that story about your dad. Mm -hmm. All right, Brooke, what other kind of stories do you want to ask us white trash guys? <laughs> um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Well, someone wanted to ask, um, well, they said, George, I love both of you guys writing, but I have to ask you, George, what's with the green head on the stairs behind you? <laughs> oh, you know, okay, look. I got a big collection of um, face jugs and I thought, man, maybe there won't be enough people to come watch Ron and me. So I'll bring all these face jugs, you know, they're normally in the den, but I put them up here on the stairs just to, let me see, is it that way? This isn't even all of them. It's about- Well, uh, well then, you know, those are not face jugs. Those are actually heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, these are, um, these are my enemies. This guy, I'm a five. It's like this guy, uh, this guy yeah, was an editor, like editor at one magazine, and this guy <laughs> was an editor at another magazine. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So, oh, was there a factual basis to the characters of the Pembertons in Serena, Ron? Uh, you know, it's fun. No, and, and it's funny because I think sometimes people are disappointed that I, you know, that you make characters up. And you know, I thought that was kind of what made it kind of cool that I could imagine somebody like these people. Um, but I, I did know that there were timber barons, and I'd read up a good bit about that. So they, yeah, I mean, I did know that uh, how they ran their operations. Um, a lot of them did come from uh, 
uh, the Northeast and they would buy up the acreage. So, but yeah, you know, um, I, that story, uh, I don't know. I, and it, I, I'd be interested in hearing George talk about this because I've been thinking about this more and more, uh, maybe too much, but um, you know, where do the stories come from? I mean, I'm, I'm a, a Jungian. I, I like that idea of the collective unconscious, the stories kind of being out there. And, uh, but I, 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 I mean, honestly, I, where these stories, it, it very often feels for me, and I, I don't, I'll be interested to hear George on this, but it's not so much that I've imagined this story as I've found it. Mm. You know, it's almost like I've tapped into something, almost more like a, you know, like a radio tower. That, and Fred Chapel, who taught George and a great writer, actually had a character in one of his books that was a storyteller and, and he would be up in a tree and it was like he was getting the wavelength. And, and I think uh, that, yeah, and, and Serena actually, the, that whole novel started with an image of a woman, uh, I didn't know who she was, a woman on horseback. Um, the sun was coming up behind her. It's almost like a crown on her head. She looked like uh, something and, and very strong. And I knew someone was looking at her with love and fear. And I mean, that's all I had when I started that book. But uh, what about that, Jordan? I mean, do you, how, how much of that is subconscious or, or mysterious to you? Well, I, you know, you're way beyond me. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's mysterious. Um, I assume, well, I, I'm glad you, you said that about the timber barons. I mean, but, but boy, out of just that, that line of, oh, there are timber barons in North Carolina back then. And then you get all of that out of that. I mean, that's kind of pretty amazing. Not kind of, that's pretty amazing. Not even, that is amazing. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, I, I just don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't want to get, you know, start getting like those uh, guys that were finding out about my uh, getting that detail wrong in the world made straight with their Ghostbusters. Yeah. But it is, I, I mean, it's just, uh, I'm kind of, there's a great story about Theodore Recchi, a poet I really admire. He said that every time he got a poem, he would get down on his hands and knees and, you know, just think wherever it came from, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, like, it's an interesting like, question. It's like Randall Jarrell said, the, um, sorry, I got gnats in this house. Um, <laughs> where'd they go? I mean, they're everywhere. Um, uh, you know, Randall Jarrell said, the chances of writing a great poem are the same as sitting in a lounge chair in your front yard and having a meteor fall in your lap. And that's kind of how it feels like when you, when you can't, well, well, a lot of times, I don't know about you, but I'll write a story and go, Boy, a meteor fell in my lap. Yeah. And you go, well, boy, that didn't work out, you know, after you send it off. And then sometimes you finish a story and go, uh, I don't know, you send it off and go, boom. And you didn't know that a meteor fell in your lap. Yeah. You know? um, all great things happen and, and you say, thank you. Thank you to whatever yeah. uh, archetypes that, Jung, that Carl Gustav Jung talked about. I'll try to get this back to Carl Gustav Jung. You did. And the shadow. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm... Brooke, how are you doing? Okay, we got time. We got, yeah. listen, we, got, we got to finish by Saturday because I really want to watch this. Um, uh, our president's going to give a speech in Georgia on Saturday, a big rally. And I really want to watch that. All it's right. going to be fun. <laughs> Don't bother. <laughs> um, do y'all have any Larry Brown stories? I do. And I do. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're good? You're good? Okay. So Larry, Larry Brown and I had the same. Larry Brown, if, if y'all don't know, uh, um, he wrote Joe and he wrote Faye and he wrote Dirty Work. And, uh, I don't like it. What, what are that? Another book, short story, the, the better known short story book I can't think of right now. Big this. Bad Love. Big, Big Bad Love. Facing the Music. Facing the Music. So, mm -hmm. probably the best, best books by him. Great short story called Samaritans. He was about five foot 
six, five foot five. He used to be a, a, a fireman in Oxford, Mississippi. And he just wrote, he had this disease like Ron and I have, I think. Why are you writing? You know, why did you start? I don't know, just started writing. He lived in Oxford, Mississippi. He failed English in high school. He had to go to summer school to graduate. He joined the Marines, he got out. He worked in a abattoir or something. I, th I think he did, I, I forget. I think he worked in, a, in, a, um, in an abattoir. And then he became a fireman and they became a fire chief. And he's writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. As it ends up, he and I had the same agent. Her name was Liz Derensoff, is Liz, Liz Derensoff. And he and I one time were in Jekyll Island, uh, Georgia. I don't know if you were there, Ron. And it was uh, some kind of uh, like SEBA or something like that, one of those things. And he and I had to do a reading at midnight for some reason, which was a stupid idea because maybe we were drinking a little bit too much throughout the whole day, waiting up for midnight. And I swear to God, you seen those clown things when you were a kid that you, you blow them up and then you punch them and they kind of go back and back like that. And you punch them and punch them. And he looked like that. It's like his feet were nailed to the ground and he was, he was going over and coming back and going over. And I was saying to him, I'm scared of Liz, our agent. He said, I'm scared to death of her too. She scares me to death. And he was going like this. And I said something to him like, and I feel bad about this, but I said, hey, I had read somewhere or heard somewhere that you quit drinking. He said, well, I've decided to just quit drinking when I'm, when I'm in town. I'll drink when I'm out of town. And I try to get out of town about five days a week, which I thought was really kind of fun, you know? And then later one time, he died on um, he died on November twenty fourth of two thousand four, right before Thanksgiving, and maybe in October. I was in Oxford and I was on the phone with him. I was in Oxford. He was in Tula, Mississippi, and I said, "Hey, how you doing?" Blah blah blah. And he said, "Why don't you come by the farm?" You know, he had a little farm in Tula. Why don't you come by the farm when you're done signing books? And then I heard this voice in the background going. We are not having any visitors over tonight. And then there was some silence. And then Larry said, maybe that's not a great idea about you. <laughs> and I went, yeah, okay. That's the last time I talked to him. As I'm sad about it. I mean, glad that I got to talk to him, but sad. So that's my Larry Brown, two, two of the stories. Well, I met him in Atlanta. And uh, we, uh, gosh, I think this was right after I think it was it's pretty early because uh, it was I think uh, it was right after he quit the fire department, you know, to go full time as a writer. And we were, you know, I, I just I'd already read him. I really admired his work. I've learned a lot from him. He's a really great writer. And uh, so anyway, he was kind of like me. I'm kind of always a little shy at these things. I'm, I'm an introvert. So we went to a bar. And just started, you know, and I'm not a big drinker, but uh, anyway, we, you know, we just drank a few beers and, but what was fun was we didn't, we never talked about literature. You know, we just talked about fishing and music. And I think that's one thing that uh, I think sometimes people don't get. I, I mean, when George and I, we'll talk about literature, but I think uh, you know, we're so immersed in it that we really, you know, there's just times we don't want to talk. You know, I'd rather, I, I find, you know, Larry Brown talking about bass fishing fascinating. And, uh, but anyway, but I did drink more than I usually do. And, and man, at the end of the day, and I just thought, you know, I'm just letting down that tradition of Southern writers because I'm a, I'm a lightweight, you know, if I drink like five beers, you know, I'm gone. And, uh, you know, he was still going strong, but a uh, really nice guy. I mean, he was very nice and uh, yeah, damn good writer. And yeah. One time, um, I think I wrote about this in that, that book, um, um, Prince of Scribes. Uh, Ron and I were in Atlanta and 
Uh, I, we had driven together and I don't remember if you know if you remember this Ron, but then when we left, we ate at that, um, like a skillet or mm -hmm. something. We ate breakfast at some point. But anyway, I was packing up my bags and Ron knocked on the door and I was in my hotel room and I said, hey, I'll be ready in a minute. And he said, Mr. Conroy wants to see you downstairs. And I'd only met him the night before. So we came downstairs, or I, or I, I, Ron and I both came downstairs, and it was a brunch, and it was packed, and there was uh, Mr. Conroy, and there was Cassandra, his wife, and I had had an article, uh, a review in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution that, that day, that Sunday, and he had it, Mr. Conroy did, and he was shaking it real hard, and he went, Mr. Big, Mr. Big, and I went, hey, Mr. Conroy. And he said, I swear, yesterday you were shit on my shoe and tomorrow you're gonna be shit on my shoe, but today you are Mr. Big. And he was laughing real hard. I mean, he was kidding around with me. His wife, Cassandra was going like, Pat, Pat, like that. And, and we had a good old time. There's a whole bunch of kind of weird writer's story. Okay, what are you looking at there, Brooke? Oh. Is Cassandra on here? <laughs> I don't think so i don't know i was just reading something else that popped up <laughs> yeah i do remember that yeah and uh, and maybe i mean that's a good thing I, we haven't talked about pat but uh damn he was so great i mean great hearted i, I don't use that term a lot but he really had that and he was uh, one of those writers that was a cheerleader for for beginning writers i mean you know you don't I don't think you see that a whole ton. Actually, I think, Ron, you and I, I think, I mean, I don't want to pat ourselves on the back, but boy, when somebody goes, I got a first book coming out, will you do a blurb? Yes, you know, I mean, you and I both do that, I think. And I think he did that. Yeah. Oh, now I know who to ask, both of you. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, now George is the one that wants most of them. <laughs> <laughs> got one, got yeah. one, yes. Got one yesterday and started it this morning. Yeah, but no, I, I think, no, Pat was great. And uh, man, uh, you know, what I missed most was the late night phone calls. You know, he would call late and, uh, oh man, you know, and, and it'd just be that, you know, booming voice about, you know, I'm the only one that can keep this faltering friendship from, you know, <laughs> what, and, you know, he was, uh, no, nah, he, uh, I miss him. And Cassandra's a wonderful person, wonderful writer. And uh, I, I'm just so glad that the, uh, we have the literary center now. I think uh, it, it's great that we can honor a writer like, you know, such as Pat, I, because I know, actually, I, I did an event with him in Highlands, North Carolina. And a young woman came in, in the room. She had a quote from uh, Prince of Tides. Uh, tattooed onto her arm. And I thought, wow, you know, I've never gotten that. <laughs> um, let's see, next question. Uh, someone gonna combine these two because they're about the same. Someone asked what's next for both of you. And then right below that, someone um, said, would you share your aspirations for the next few years as writers? George talked about submitting and not hearing from anyone. Most of us get that. So I guess just talk about what's next for, for both of you as writers. I'm just, I'm just writing stories. I've been writing stories since this pandemic. Um, and, you know, I'm having a good old time. I probably have enough for, um, I think I have enough for a, a new book of stories. But to be quite honest, I'm, I'm not all that uh, not all that excited about, especially during the pandemic. I hate to say it, but these Zoom things are have been fun, but it's not the same as kind of meeting people in person. And and I'm a little bit too old to um, to want to even travel anymore. So I'm just writing, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, I. I you know, part of it's my age. I, I'm kind of slowing down. Uh, I've worked on a couple of stories and, uh, you know, uh, 
I don't know. I'm just kind of in a place where I don't know what I'm going to do next. Uh, I mean, I'm even thinking about nonfiction, but uh, really, we'll see. Really, are you really? You're thinking? I think that's a cool idea. Well, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, I, I you know, we'll go back to the track analogy, and I think writers have periods in their lives where they really, like athletes, they really do their best work. And usually it's about 10 year span. And I think I've been through that. And I think what you want to do now is just try to, you know, write as well as you can. And, uh, but just accept the fact that, you know, you're, you're not in that kind of perfect place. You're not in the zone. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's amazing when you look back at, I think American literature that, you see these moments where these writers, I, I always think of Twain, you know, he's at that point where that kind of age and, you know, whatever you get from age, wisdom, cynicism at times, and that humor, he, he, he hits Huckleberry Finn and, it, you know, it just goes up to a whole nother level. Yeah. Fitzgerald did that with the great Gatsby. But I think what makes Faulkner such a great writer is he did it with about five novels. I mean, there was a yeah. period where all the, you know, most of the novels, almost everything that we admire by Faulkner was written. And, uh, and I mean, you, I, I just feel blessed and lucky that I had those years, you know, that, that moment when those things, but it can happen at different times for different writers, you know? Yeah, I think that's not a bad, that's not a, God, that's, that's a good, it's kind of like, uh, you know, we cook grits and then we cook shrimp and grits, cheese grits. We've gone through every grit recipe and they go, I'm kind of out, you know, what am I going to, what am I going to do with grits anymore? Mm -hmm. uh, I need to start cooking some omelets or eggs or something like that. You, you may be right. I've thought about this nonfiction stuff, but I mean, I'm always amazed at these people who are writing these essay collections that are got that are so diverse. I mean, essays that are just all over the place and just kind of fun. John Jeremiah Sullivan in Pulpwood, for example, I go, God dang, how how can you do this? You know, yeah. one about music, about whatever. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't want to write about myself. I'm the most boring person alive, just, you know, but, um, I, you know, I do, I, I still have a curiosity about other people and uh, their lives. And, you know, and there are certain issues that, I, you know, I think are really important. I don't know, you know, we'll see. But uh, I think everybody right now because of COVID and just, I think we're all a little bit, you know, not unsure. Uh, and, uh, but I, yeah, you know, but I, I have found that writing has, has, has been a really nice escape during all this. Uh, yeah. you know, I could go in and, and kind of lose myself in it. I needed that or no other, even if the work's not that good, just to get outside of all the, what we're dealing with. Um, knowing that I may be a little bit too close and get in trouble, but you and I could both write about um, projects that have been brought up upon us around the house. Can you hear that, Glenda? <laughs> oh, never mind. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> it gives us an excuse, right? <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm an artist. You know, I need, I need this time. <laughs> oh man. Uh, we'll, we'll all, we'll all sieve it in there. It'll be okay. Yeah, well, well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we've been talking about writers. Uh, somebody, I just saw a question flash about some of the writers that we've been reading lately. And, uh, you know, I, actually, I've been rereading Faulkner with great, I mean, even greater appreciation. I don't know how he did that. Yeah, I don't know either. I, I mean, that, that, those novels that he wrote from like 28 to about 36, you know, Absalom, Absalom, Sound the Fury as I Lay Dying, just, incredible um uh, even the bad even the what well, i guess what are considered bad ones like sanctuary yeah a I little know. bit a little bit of a kind of a 
I mean, the most bizarre genre piece, but I, I, it's, it's, it's amazing. And they're all amazing. Yeah. And I think one thing that's interesting to me, I was actually talking to our friend Steve Yarbrough about this. Uh, you know, you spent, we spent our lives pretty much, you know, not all our lives, <laughs> but a good part of our lives really dedicated to writing and really trying to do it as well as we can and reading. And I'm, we're both intense readers. And I, I think when you get to our age and you, you can look back and read these writers the way you might not have when you were 20 or 21, you just realize how great they are. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the other writer that does this for me is Thomas Hardy. He's a writer I really did not want to read when I was like 20 or 21, but boy, now. But yeah, Faulkner, I, I think I can read him on a level, I, I, well, I know I can, that I wouldn't have when I was 20. Yeah, yeah for, uh, for me, it's uh, um, Joseph Conrad. I, I hated when I was 22, and now I go, man, you know, that's pretty, Heart of Darkness is, is pretty friggin' amazing. You with the novella uh, in this new book, I mean, golly, I mean, he pulled that off. I don't know if, I don't know if Heart of Darkness would be called a novella. I, I would call it that. Yeah, that, I would. You know. Yeah, and that's a tough form. I mean, you know, one, one thing, I, I never written a novella, so in, in the Valley, I mean, it was really, a challenge to write, try to write one. Mm -hmm. You know, we both love Train Dreams by Dennis Johnson. And, yeah. You know, Annie Prue has written some longer stories such as Brookback Mountain, which are really kind of just teetering between novella and short stories. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great form. And uh, yeah. And hard in America right now. I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah, and I, I would, I, I do want to tell a, a quick story on Conroy. Uh, we were doing an event in the Highlands and, you know, he, he was so sharp, so quick that he would just nail you. But we were doing a question and answer and all the questions were for him, of course. But a uh, woman said, you know, I, I wish, you know, when I read you, I just don't want the books to never end. And uh, I was up there with him and I said, uh, well, you picked the right writer. <laughs> and, and, you know, for the one time in my life, you know, Conroy was speechless. <laughs> funny, funny. And true. Brooke? I, yeah, I guess that was the, Ron, you saw that question um, to talk about your favorite writers. So that was your answers uh, there. Um, where are y'all seeing these questions? I don't see any questions. <laughs> We're keeping them from you, George. Um, uh, it says once a, <laughs> once a minute. Now, uh, Do you see them on the? Well, now I don't see anybody. So hold on. Okay. I may be off. Well, if you quit using that peyote. <laughs> uh, um, once a manuscript is finished, do you feel paying for professional editing services is worthwhile for a new author, or is there another path you recommend? Where did George go? I don't know. <laughs> um, he accidentally dropped out, but oh, okay. I don't know. He'll come uh, back. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You know. Uh, things have changed so much since I broke in as far as self-publishing and, um, you know, questions like that. I do know that I will say this, that I've been very lucky in that I've had editors who made my books better. Uh, I'm back, baby. I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I would, yeah, I would say that if you can find the right person, I, I think what you uh, we're talking about, you know, having a, a paid editor look at George. Hear the full question, George. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. yeah. But I would I would say the one thing you you I mean you want an editor who's who's going to make the book better. You got to get rid of your ego. But uh, I think what you got to look for is someone who doesn't want to write his or her book, your book. 
you know, I think sometimes one of the risk is that someone will, you know, kind of read a, read a book and they're using what they want the book to be. And I mean, sometimes that may be better, but at the same time, I think uh, the, the, the best editors are, have this great gift for uh, the ability to understand what the, you know, the writer's trying to do, you know, and help the writer better get that. George? Well, I, sorry, but I tried to figure out who's, who's asking questions and I screwed up and got turned off, but about editors. Um, you know, an editor at a book or a magazine, I think is uh, usually, it's not like that editor is trying to make you worse. They want the best for their book or mag. I mean, it's not like they want to put out something bad. Now there are some editors, we can think about people like uh, Raymond Carver's editor or Barry Hanna's, Hanna's editor, who happened to be Gordon Lich. Yeah. And I think, he, which made those books a little bit different. I think those books are great. I mean, I think Hannah and and Carver are way different uh, writers, but I think that's good. I wouldn't pay. Was there a question here about yeah about pay. paying paying somebody? I'm not sure I would do that, but I mean, I wouldn't pay. I mean, I could go online and say, "Hey, buddy, I'll pay you." Pay me some money, I'll edit your book. I'm not sure you'd want me to do that, you know, but, but maybe, uh, you know, but I'd, well, first of all, I wouldn't do it, but um, is, is that kind of the question and kind of the answer? Yeah. Ron, you wouldn't, I mean, you, you kind of sell your book and you get an editor and the editor says, hey, I think we want this book, but I think the, I think the novel, lags a little bit on page 200 to 240 why don't you do something about that it's probably because it does lag on page yeah. 240. yeah I'll, I'll tell you the one exception of that that happened to me was i had a well, I wrote one foot in eden which has five points of view that yeah I, a, a publisher that said you know i'll uh, publish this but we want it all from the one point of view and i just oh. I, I mean, you know, I just said no. I mean, because I knew that book. I, but I mean, so my point being, I think there's a level where you have to have a certain belief in yourself. Yet, at the same time, I've, I've had a, an editor, you know, Lee Boudreau, who's my editor now, who, uh, you know, when I was working on Serena and the Cove, she kept me from doing some things that would have hurt those books. So I, I, there's, there's this point where you have, I mean, it's like almost like walking a tightrope between your own confidence in your work and yet still remaining open. Yeah. I want to tell this story about you and me. This right. is a funny story. It has to do with one foot in Eden. Can I tell it? Once upon a time, um, there was a Barnes and Noble in Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> And whoever's in charge of bringing writers there, she wrote to me and said, will you come do a reading with 15 local writers who've just published their books, uh, et cetera. And I didn't answer. And then she wrote and she said, Ron Rash is gonna be there. So I said, okay, I'll be there if Ron's gonna be there. When's up? She just said that, like she, Ron, then she wrote Ron and said, Jordan's going to be there. So Ron said, okay, well, I'll be there. So we got there. And it was Ron and me and a really fine writer named Mark Powell. So that's three of us. And then 12 self-published writers. So I couldn't understand why Barnes & Noble would want 12 self-published writers to be there. But anyway, so she said, you're just going to sign books. That's supposed to be what we're going to do. We're all going to sit at the table sign books. We got there and she said, I want y'all to read for like one to two minutes each. George, you start. So I went, one to two minutes, I don't know. So I got out my book, <laughs> minutes, what the hell am I gonna read? So I read, damn, where are my glasses? It's not this book. But what I read was All Rights Reserved, 
No part of this book may be reproduced in any form by the electronic means, including information, book design, front cover. I just read that. Well, the woman said, well, that was, and people were like, that was terrible. Uh, and I'd said to Ron earlier, I said, hey, I'm going to read like the copyright page. And he said, yeah, do it, do it. <laughs> I did it. I looked over at him and he was looking away from me, right? Like, <laughs> he screwed me over. <laughs> that did. So I got done. And the woman then said, our next reader is Ron Rash. And Ron Rash has written a novel that I could not put down. It's called One Foot in Eden. And I read it all in one sitting. It was great. I couldn't put it down. The best novel I've ever read. So Ron gets up there to read and he reads it. But wherever, I forget the character's names, Ron. Who's the main character in part one? Uh, the sheriff, yeah, well. Yeah. No, 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 no. One Foot in Eden, the guy who's it's got a wife who goes over to the neighbor's oh, house. Billy Holcomb, yeah, Billy Holcomb, yeah. yeah. Billy, yeah. So he, he reads about this guy, and when the guy's, he's talking about the guy's wife goes over to the neighbors to have sex with the guy's neighbor, he, he calls the guy's neighbor Singleton. So he says, <laughs> my wife went over to Singleton's house and had sex <laughs> with him. I'm going to kill Singleton. I hate Singleton. <laughs> went on and on about Singleton. And when he got done, this woman from Barnes Noble got up to the microphone and said, did you really use George Singleton's name for this thing? And Ron and I both yelled out, I thought you read that novel in the sitting. You couldn't put it down, all that. And she just went, our next reader is good. So when it was done, we were all supposed to sign books and I just left. I went next door to, uh, there was like some Mexican yeah. something. I yeah. You were deep into the Tecante as I remember. Yeah, I started drinking some like tequila or something like that. And then about a half hour went by and Ron came over and he said, that woman's looking for you. She thinks you're hiding from her in the book, in the stacks of books. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> oh, we're bad boys. That was the old days. Now we're normal, especially me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Brooke, how are you doing? I'm doing great, yeah. Um, I guess we're we're here at the end, so I hate to say, because I'm uh, having so much fun <laughs> listening to you tell stories. Um, I guess can we, we're gonna... can we tell people to go buy our books? <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> tell them. Yeah. I was yeah. going to remind them that, yes, um, Lori can help uh, with that. At Nevermore Books, you can get signed copies. Um, uh, yeah, so, but yeah, George, Ron, go ahead if you want to say it for yourself. Well, I, I mean, we're, we're at the point now where, you know, the bank is getting ready to foreclose on our loans, and we may be homeless. So, <laughs> you know, any any book sale is, is, is very much appreciated unless you want to, Come hear our next reading from under a bridge. I, I have to, I have to go get the car and drive down to the soup kitchen in a minute. I wish y'all would hurry up and buy some books. Yeah, uh, you know, at least give me enough money to get, you know, buy a sleeping bag because it's pretty cold out there under that bridge, broad French Broad River Bridge. Yeah. Fish aren't biting, so I may need to get up, you know, some pork rinds or Cheetos uh, from. You know, <laughs> about five miles and get something to eat so uh anyway yeah if you will do this public service and buy our book you may prevent this and you will not have to look back on your lives 10 years from now and ask what happened to singleton and rice <laughs> and do and do you know we appreciate it y'all yeah we yes do. No. really these are both great Great, and um, I thank y'all so much for doing this. Uh, thank glad you. To do it. Yeah, it's been great, and um, thank you everyone for uh, joining us this evening. Um, again, Nevermore Books. Um, if you'd like, uh, they have signed copies in stock, and um, yeah. So, uh, Ron, George, keep writing so we can keep reading, and um, hopefully one day I'll uh, 
get to see you guys in person and I can get these signed. <laughs> Good deal, bro. Well, I hope we could do something. George, and I, I mean, it'd be great for us to do something at the Conroy Center. So maybe yeah. once the COVID lifts, we could do that. 2023, <laughs> baby. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all so much. Well, thank, thank you. Bye, Jonathan, too. Yeah, Jonathan. Bye, y'all. Bye, Ron. Bye.